Okay. Hi. <laughs> Such a lovely day today. Um, thank you for being here today. My name is Carlos Ortega. I'm the curator here at Rancho Los Cerritos. Um, Rancho Los Cerritos is located in the ancestral lands of the Gabrielino Tongva people, who are the past, present, and future caretakers of the Los Angeles Basin and Southern China, China Islands. And um, the Tongva people uh, are present. They have been here, and they're still here among us. Welcome to the third lecture of Roots in California, Concepts of Home, a speaker series. The title of the lecture is Beyond the Rancho, Creating Home in Post-Conquest Los Angeles. Uh, the, spe the speaker series is sponsored by the California Humanities, and it aims to provide further context for the stories featured in our current exhibition, Roots in California, Concepts of Home, which is located at the Center. Um, our speaker today is Associate Professor Margie Brown Coronel from the History Department at Cal State University Fullerton. She earned her PhD uh, in History from the University of California, Irvine. Yeah. Professor Brown Coronel teaches U.S. History, Borderlands History, U.S. Women's History, and Public History at Cal State uh, University Fullerton. Prior to her current position, Margie lived in the Washington, D.C. area and held a postdoctoral fellowship at the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of American History. At Cal State University Fullerton, Brown Cornell has led several public history projects on U.S. Latina history and now serves as faculty fellow for the College of Humanities uh, Collective on Justice, Equity, and Transformation. So Professor Brown Coronel is about to take us on a journey to explore how California families sought ways to reestablish and affirm their social and cultural significance in Southern California through very specific examples. Um, we want to keep this very informal, so it will be more conversation staff. Feel free to interrupt at any time with any questions you might have. Um, let's give um, let's give her a round of applause. Thank you so much, Carlos, for the introduction, and thank you for the invitation to come share a little bit about what I have learned in the last um, 20 years that I've been studying California history, so I've been at it a while. Um, like Carlos says, I teach history at Cal State Fullerton, and I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for spending your Sunday afternoon with us here in this beautiful place, which is not too bad a place to work for you, I would say. Um, so yeah, perfect afternoon. Um, so a main question I have for us to explore today together is how did families adjust to the post-conquest era in here in the Los Angeles area? Um, and if you've had a chance to tour some of the different rooms and the exhibits, the, um, this time period after the United States takes over California is a really dynamic period. It's full of transitions. Um, and so that's what we'll explore today, is how do families navigate this time period? And I like to first frame why we use the word conquest, is because the U.S.-Mexico War of 1848 was part of a much larger agenda for the United States to reach from the East Coast to the West Coast of what is this North American region that we now call the United States. Um, so there was a war, there, was a, there were battles, and most importantly, it was a great moment of transition and adjustment for the peoples who lived here. Not to mention the Tongva and uh, the native indigenous peoples who inhabited this land for thousands of years, but for the Spanish-Mexican families who had settled this region uh, during the Spanish colonial era. So we'll be looking at some of the families and communities that lived here in Southern California. So these folks, the Spanish-Mexican people who migrate, migrated from different parts of Mexico to settle in California, part of the kind of Spanish colonial effort with the missions, uh, there were families who came up from places like Sinaloa, Sonora, and Nayarit. So the family that I research is called the Del Valle family. And one of the ways in which we know so much 
or what we do know about these families is through family archives. And so I just want to take a quick moment to talk about this woman here on the right. Her name is Josefa del Valle, and she was born in 1861. So she was born after, but her mother, right here, her name is Isabel Varela del Valle, and her mother, Ascension, they were all born in California. So Ascension's father was Antonio Ignacia, Ignacio Avila, who was one of the first settlers in Los Angeles um, with the Anza expedition. And they settled in the city, or in the plaza of Los Angeles, the Pueblo. And what I find remarkable about this family, and per perhaps Carlos has found with the Temple family, is that they were exceptional record keepers. They kept track of family notes, of ledgers, of receipts, of baptisms, just all kinds of things. Do, does anybody have a junk drawer? Like somewhere where you throw old mail and things like old invitations and... This is what these folks did. They, they had maybe a chest or a trunk, and they put all their family documents in those, um, in those holdings. So they have really, really important family archives. The archive that I researched at is called the Seaver Center for Western Research, and it's located at, at the Los Angeles County Museum of Natural History over in Exposition Park. So there are lots of family archives there. And one of the things that these families did, and I've noticed this kind of pattern across different families, and in particular the Levaya family, is they wrote a lot to each other in the 19th century. So this is an example of a letter that Josefa wrote to her mother when she went to go visit the World's Exposition in um, Chicago in 1893. Uh, so there are records of letters, notes written across families, um, that tell us a little bit about what their day-to-day -day life is like. So we can learn about the big political moments, right? Um, but the letters and the family archives kind of give us a window into how people spent their days, how they felt at the end of the night, when they sat down to write a letter, what they did in the morning, kind of like the everyday life that, that you and I have right now. Imagine their Facebook posts, right? Like kind of things like that. Um, so to talk to kind of a bigger picture in uh, California society during this time period is that land was issued to those who came to settle and served in the military or were going to contribute some kind of uh, production to the land that would fortify um, the, the settlement and development of California. And this was done through land, right? So folks like in this particular case here at Rancho Los Cerritos, it was Manuel Nieto. He was a soldier. He put in a petition for a land grant. Um, he said what he would do with the land. The Del Valle family, led by the patriarch, his name was Ignacio Del Valle, got the land for um, Rancho Camulos. This, this rancho is located on what is now the Santa Clarita Valley up between uh, Los Angeles and Ventura County. Um, so if you're familiar where Magic Mountain is, just over those hills. So one thing that was, is important to understand about this land grant system is that it was they were huge. They were huge. I think this was 23,000 acres? 27,000 27, acres. Camulos was about 11,000 acres. So it was a little on the smaller side, but that's still pretty big. Um, the, the land was understood while it was privately held was communally used because they, they herded cattle or sheep. So it was understandable that numerous different families and owners would use the land together. Another thing that's interesting during this time period is that women could be property owners. And in the East Coast of uh, what is it was the United States back then, women were not allowed to own property unless they um, inherited it as a widow. But here in California, under Spanish and then Mexican law, women could be property owners. And so you have a lot of people, uh, or you have a few cases where women are running ranchos. And I think there's an example of um, Maria Amparo de Burton, Luis de Burton, who is one of these women. But they're select. And I think what that does is that it tells us that women during this time period, and this is what I study, they felt ownership over the land. 
they took charge of administering the land. They took charge of managing the land. And the way we know that is through the letters, right? So even though perhaps in a family it was the man who owned the, the, the land, it was the women who were operating things. And that was certainly the case in Rancho Camulos, and I'll get to that in just a bit. The main industry and environment during this time period was cattle and or sheep, right? So I think Campo was a sheep herd. Um, and the Bixby's, but over in Rancho Camulos, they did a combination of the two. They did, um, they did cattle and then sheep. So this is what the uh, land grant would look like. I want to note that on this grant, there's no like really big expansion of a house, right? It's mostly used for the main industry, which was cattle, and that's a big reason was because environment. Right? This wasn't really the terrain to grow fields and fields of food. Can anybody guess why? It's too dry. It's dry. too dry, yes. It's a, it's a desert. Yeah, and hence the need for communal sense, right? Everybody needed to have access to water. The herds, all everybody's herd needed access to water. And it just was not conducive to growing, you know, rows and rows, kind of like what was familiar to Americans who come west, right? They see all this land. Why don't you use it? It's like, can't grow anything here, it's dry. Um, so that's an important element to understand in the map, you know, and, and I'll get to this in just a little bit as to kind of what, how else this land was used, right? Well, one, re one of the reasons why you don't see this big expansive of a house on those land titles or those maps is because everybody lived during this time period in the Plaza of Los Angeles, the Pueblo. So you'll see here, this is what the plaza or pueblo might have looked like in the 1850s or 1860s. Right? It looks a little different from how it looks today, but you can see the kind of center of town is right here. And then this steeple right there is the plaza church, which is where I was baptized. <laughs> I was baptized in the, um, the Nuestra Señora de la Reina de Los Angeles uh, church, which was the one that was established in the plaza. So everybody's living here in the plaza. And this is what the kind of layout of the homes would be. So it's mentioned in one of the exhibits that Temple was rarely here on a day-to-day -day basis. He's living kind of with his neighbors over here in the plaza. The family that I research is the Del Valle family, and their adobe in the plaza was right there, right on the plaza. The church is right here. And you can see some other familiar names, like Abel Stearns, uh, his home is there, Andres and Pio Pico, they have their home there, the Dominguez family, they have their home there, and the Avila family, they have their home. Lugo, um, Cota, all kinds of families have their home here in the plaza. And so what I want to make clear is that this was a social and cultural and political hub of Los Angeles of this whole region in at the moment of conquest of 1840 until about 1860. So this is where people are, um, they are organizing politically together, they are socializing with each other, they're going to mass, they're baptizing each other's children, they're marrying each other, you know, their sons and daughters. Um, so it's a very tight-knit community here on the plaza. And this was the community that Josefa's mother, Isabel, grew up in. Right? So this was familiar. This was home to her. Right? If we think about the idea of what does home mean. Home to Isabel Varela de Valle was the plaza and all the dynamics that were happening there. And then there's this big moment of transition, right? In 1848 concludes the U.S.-Mexico War through the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. And then right off of the heels of that is the California Gold Rush. And what does that do? It brings in thousands and thousands of migrants from all over the world, from the rest of the United States. And you know, as we know, not everybody found gold. Right? So there are a bunch of busts. So where did people go who had come out to find gold? They start settling in major cities like San Francisco or Sacramento when down here in Los Angeles, they come down to Los Angeles because there was a port and it was a major kind of, it had a vibe to it. Um, so if one couldn't find gold, 
what's the next best thing, or maybe even better than gold, is land. So if folks come west looking for land, they see land, right? And not necessarily a very strong presence. Right? Maybe one small structure it doesn't really show that people are living here, right? So that's where the um, U.S. Land Commission, which was a court system of evaluating people's ownership to land, right? So say for it, I think there was an exhibit, so there were like 16 claims to this land, like all kinds of people were saying, well, no, this is my land, and this is the border, and this is my land, this is my border. So there, what was a way to review all the evidence to decide whose land it was? The United States sets up the U.S. Land Commission in 1851 to review land cases and who is a rightful owner. Um, the Delia family spent about seven years in court defending their title in the U.S. Land Commission. Now, I'll tell you a little bit about the U.S. Land Commission. First, it was conducted in English, right? And so most of the folks here, they spoke Spanish. And all their documents were in Spanish as well. So what does that mean? Well, first, it's a court system, so you need an attorney, right? You need an attorney familiar with land. You need um, a translator, right? You need witnesses. You need to get documents sometimes from either from Mexico or sometimes even Spain to prove your land. So folks spent years defending their titles which made them go into debt. And as a result of that debt, they had to sell off their land. So when we think about the kind of that moment of conquest, right, it's like, it's not a military came over and kind of swept people and dislocated people. It was a kind of a slow, steady, chipping away at a system that was once the way it was and implementing a new system where people lost their land through debt. So what, do, what message does this give to families who are like maybe really worried about what's going to happen to their land? It means they need to move from the plaza to the rancho to show permanency, to show a presence, to show a proper use of land, because that's really important to American systems of recognition, right? That you live there, you use it, and you're present. So how do families recreate home under these conditions? What do they do? Has anybody moved from one city to another? Or one neighborhood to another? Or one house to another? It takes time. Like sometimes it gets reluctant. It's not by choice. You have to. So if you could imagine Isabel, Isabel Varela del Valle right here, who lives very comfortably with her mom and her children and her neighbors and her church is right across the street and her store and everything, you know, it's a well, and her, you know, I'm, I don't have documentation of this, it's just a sudden, it's a, in a letter where Ignacio del Valle writes to a friend and says, it looks like we're going to have to move and make some changes to the rancho. And he says, you know that's not our normal lifestyle. I'm not that kind of guy. <laughs> So imagine, you know, him trying to convince his wife. So what does she say? All right, so we'll go back to this, you know, landscape where it's rugged, it's for cattle. It's not necessarily the space to take one's family that was used to being the Blessa. So this is just a map out. So there you're going from Los Angeles out to Rancho Camulos, which was a day's... Um, a horse a carriage ride. I think it was mentioned it was six hours to Los Angeles. From Los Angeles to Rancho Camulos was a whole day by carriage. Uh, there was no 101 freeway. You had to go up and around and cut through this valley um, along the Santa Clarita River. This is where the land was. Now, one thing that's really important about the Del Valle family that I think is really smart on their part is when it came to the portions of the land that they sold off, so they sell Tejon Ranch, right? You know, when you come up and over the five, there's Tejon, the outlets. That was their land. They sell off that. They keep the land that borders water, right? So they keep the rights to the Santa Clara, um, Santa Clarita River, as well as the Paiu Creek. And so they have two water sources that they have to kind of maintain some kind of agricultural production, as well as grazing sheep and cattle on their land. 
and that was a really strategic choice by their on their part because they knew to sustain ourselves to maintain our relevance here we need access to water so they hop in their carriage and at this time um, Josefa who I started the story out with is uh, six months old and they, they make the journey out to um, to Rancho Camulos. Now Rancho Camulos, one of the things that they do is they make the transition from cattle, which is on the downturn, to citrus and to other agricultural products. In fact, it is said that they were the first ones to grow oranges in Ventura County. And Wolf Skill, who is, a, who is one of the early um, American settlers, he brings the seeds and he's the one that's kind of planting this new crop. Now that the family moves to Rancho Camulos, there's a shift in the kind of gender roles and family networks and that now this is a family enterprise and I'll show you in just a bit. Um, and what's at the core of this is that this family, in the context of conquest, in the context of change, they're really trying to maintain their, their authority. They're trying to maintain their relevance. But there's still an important family in this region. So how do they go about doing that? Well, I imagine Isabel sat down with her husband, Ignacio, and said, well, there's no way we all fit in that one bedroom adobe that was built for the mayordomo who, you know, looked over the cattle, right? I need something a little bigger. So she sits out, and this is a layout of how the adobe, much like the one behind us, or in front of you, behind me, was expanded. And you'll see what was added. She had a cocina, which was a kitchen added, the wraparound porch, the bedrooms, five, six, seven, eight, were all constructed and new. She had a garden installed, she had a chapel built, and she had vesper services every day. Evening mass, morning mass, she had baptisms, she, you know, she recreated the life of the plaza at Rancho Camus. And I think that's how she recreated home. So this is how she, uh, you can, the, it's hard to see, but I'll share with Carlos. Is, is the kitchen, those four rooms, it, was that that big of a size or just the, the one on the left? No, it's, it's this whole thing and it wow. even included like some outdoor prep. And if you folks have questions or comments, please chime in, I'm happy to. How was it? Do you know why was the kitchen such took so much space within the So I think that it was big because Isabel wanted everybody to be able to eat. So um, so the uh, adobe is expanded beginning in 1861. Um, and in a key moment in 1884, the railroad comes through Southern California. And the Dalai family negotiate a stop at Rancho Camulos. So with evening services and them being on the path from Los Angeles to Santa Barbara, they always had a priest staying with them. They always had visitors. They had people uh, in commerce, merchants. Um, all kinds of people were always stopping. So I think she knew or she wanted this and knew workers, servants, family members, um, so why, that's why it was so, so large. Um, and Rancho Comodos is still, it's a historic home and you can go and check it out today. So I think this was one of the ways she recreated home. How do I recreate the life that I had in the plaza? How do I create a social and cultural hub in Rancho Comodos like I had in the plaza? And so she has a church, she has a large home, a large casino, a very large dining room, but that's not enough, right? So the home at this time, because of all the changes in Los Angeles and in California, they knew the home also had to be a place of production. So in their shifts, not only do they expand the living space and kind of social and cultural activities of the family, they bring in new production to Rancho Camulos. So here, this is a picture of um, walnut shelling season. So this is an evening. I think this is a really cool picture because you can see all kinds of people, right? One, there's a lot of people, a lot of workers. 
they have lights hanging from the trees, some kind of lit, so you know this was going to go into the evening or into the night. Um, in, 18, in the 1880s, Josefa is writing to friends, to some of her friends and cousins who are members of the Temple family, the Mott family, like they all knew each other, um, talking about how they packed oranges, how they picked, they harvested beans, how they, uh, the wine season, you know, grape season, they had an arbor, they had a winery, they had a cellar, um, in addition to sheep shearing, right? So the home, Rancho Comulos, also becomes a place of production. And at the head of this production is Isabel and her daughter, Josefa de Valle. Yeah. What time of year is all the time is Good question. I do not know. Fall. <laughs> fall? Late summer. Early fall. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. What? Before the <laughs> Over by the coal, I mean. Um, I mean, I think one thing here in California is stuff grows all the time. Right, but um, no, this is sunlight and water. <laughs> Probably not in summer when it's drying. Um, but yeah, I don't know when walnut season. I'll double check and see if this picture has a month. Um, but this is in the 1880s. I talked a little bit about how um, one of the uh, major developments at Rancho Comulos was the arrival of the railroad. And this is the team of workers who built the railroad. Um, and you can see there are all kinds of folks uh, participating. And then they documented this, right? These are all photographs that are part of the, the Lyon family archive. Um, and I think it's important to understand that back then, having a photographer go to one's home instead of taking a studio picture was a, a, was a privilege and it was a luxury. Um, so with the Elias kind of understanding this moment of transition, shifting their land to being a home, to being a place of production, um, this man Brewster, who was a photographer in the late 19th century, um, did all kinds of photographs across the West. And so he's stopping at Camulos and documenting this development. This is a picture of the winery. Camulos um, and the Delaya family become the suppliers of the olive oil and the wine that's used by the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. So they um, begin to market their products. Um, in 1888, Helen Hunt Jackson, seeking to document the history of California and the plight of indigenous peoples, she stops at Rancho Camulos, her the advice of Antonio Coronel, who is a local fam, um, leader here in Los Angeles, um, and she gathers inspiration about the landscape she's going to write about in her novel, and then Rancho Camulos takes off as a tourist destination of people seeking Ramona from the novel Ramona. And they, 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 they call their wine Home of Ramona wine and oranges. So they profit big time from that. Um, but what we have at Rancho Camulos are four generations of women who are overseeing and kind of at the heart of these transitions. Um, they're writing letters to each other. They're talking about business. Um, Isabel is been asking her son to negotiate a better deal with the railroad and where to put the depot. Um, right now, uh, the Delvayes, this family is profiled in the National Museum of American History at the Smithsonian for weathering these transitions. When many other families were kind of transitioning in a different way, maybe not so successfully, losing their land, um, finding other ventures, the Delvayes the family is maintaining their land through these different efforts. And it's the women that are overseeing them. Um, Josefa did have an older brother. His name was Reginaldo. And he was a state senator, a state assemblyman, I'm sorry. And so he's off in Sacramento kind of doing a political thing. And there's really kind of no head of family after their father dies to take hold of things. And so the women step in. Was the California legislature at that time a full-time legislature? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, my understanding. He was up there for quite a bit. And when he wasn't, he was down in Los Angeles, not at Rancho Camulos. Yeah. Certainly demanding at their time. 
And um, once the railroad comes in, the family, one way they also navigate this time period is they take advantage of the railroads and the new streetcars by visiting one another and sending letters and kind of keeping a very strong family and social network across Southern California. Where did the money uh, for the Valle family to move up north come from? Like what, what were they? How, how did they acquire their wealth? How did they move from Camulos up north and oh. started building mm -hmm. home, you know, expanding their rancho? Where did all that money come from? I think they're profiting from the cattle industry. So that's their main um, business. Um, they were also kind of politically influential. Ignacio del Valle was the last alcalde, the mayor of the Mexican Los Angeles. Um, I think they sell land as well. And I think, um, yeah, yeah, that's, pr that's pretty much how they do. Mm -hmm. And then once they transition to agricultural products and cattle starts to kind of fade off as a sustainable source, um, they, they really kind of are able to sustain themselves a little better. So they, um, you know, that's really interesting that you asked that question. So they were friends with Wolf Skill, who was a, he, he was a, a rancher as well, uh, experimenting with citrus. Um, but one way I would say they, they did this was in the family archive, going back to what the archive tells us, they had subscriptions to agricultural uh, periodicals and magazines and newsletters. And so I think, one, they're probably sharing information with one another. And then they're hiring people. They have a team of workers. I mean, that's the next kind of part of my research is understanding who worked for them, who cared, who were the laborers who carried out alongside them this this work. Um, but they're learning as they go. Is Del Valle the Del Valle brand? No. Yeah. Um, so on the day to day, when they're not kind of working at producing items in Rancho Camulos, they're taking part in different kind of family and social activities. Like here, um, Isabel Barrera del Valle, she required um, May Day, First Communion, um, baptisms, and they would all gather. So this is the, the veranda, south-facing veranda of, of Rancho Camulos. I think they were highly, strongly encouraged. Um, you know, it was one of those relationships between, you know, um, those who owned the land and those who worked. Um, so yeah, she kept record of who was baptized. Um, at the same time, she was she and Josefa were the midwife and nurses. And so in the letters, Josefa is often documenting how her mother went out to help deliver a baby, to help nurse somebody who was sick. Um, so yeah, so I think there were these kind of very hierarchical relationships where, yeah, you did what the owner says is the thing to do. <laughs> um, and then also perhaps a little bit of reciprocity. Not not to um, overlook the paternalistic, right? Like the kind of, this is what's best for you that the owners probably had with their, with their workers, or the Del Valle family. Um, as I mentioned before, why that kitchen was so big, you know, they had an annual barbecue where they organized and brought people all out and people stayed here. Um, there are letters that are part of the Del Valle collection from, you know, people in Boston who are writing 10 years later saying, you know, that stop that I made at your home where you sat and talked to me about your husband and your childhood in the Plaza. I'll always remember that. Um, so, so they were just receiving visitors from all over. Um, in this particular barbecue, there's a countess of somewhere from somewhere in Europe <laughs> visiting. I'm sorry. I think she's the one in the white hat in the middle. Um, but, you know, in these photographs, we kind of learn how this family got along, right? So Josefa had a younger sister, 
Um, she had a half older brother named Juventino who had children and daughters. And is that me moving? Okay. So you'll see in the this is Josefa right here. They all have the same pattern dresses. So you know that you know the the home was getting mega supplies in their ledgers where it says, you know, 60 pairs of shoes, right? Like 100 yards of, of gingham cloth, um, all kinds of items. So you know this place really did, in fact, kind of support either people labored there or they lived there or they worked there. Um, so this is kind of one of those examples where you see kind of they all have the same kind of dress on. Yeah. This is the first picture with a musical instrument in it. Uh -huh. Did they do anything that supported the arts? Yes. You, yes, yes, yes. I don't know how I'm going to have the time. Um, but if I had uh, the, this, this is, yes, I see the accordion, but they did. They played the guitar. They sang. In fact, Charles Loomis, I believe, recorded some of their singing of old Spanish ballads and songs. Um, I, they might be at the Autry Museum, but yeah, they did. They they certainly had music uh, playing their photographs of them with the musical instruments. The the women, it's women playing. The women playing guitar and singing. I know the gentleman here has the has the accordion. Speaking of things that they supported, um, in selling land, right? They were able to maintain wealth and status. Um, so it does come to a point where Josefa, in her older years, can no longer live at Rancho Camulos. So she moves back to Los Angeles. She always has a home in Los Angeles um, that she shares with her husband, who was John Forster of the Forster family down in San Juan Capistrano. Right, so, um, and she goes and she lives there. And um, Oh, so she starts different philanthropic projects. And one of the things that she's very much invested in in terms of supporting is a Catholic church, and in particular, um, education. So they're big supporters of what was St. Vincent's College, which was a men's college. Eventually, I think it becomes Loyola Marymount University. Um, so Loyola Marymount University actually holds in their collections and the books that the Lelaya family had in their library. It, and it has all the, um, the religious clothes, vestments, um, that the priests would wear, and then how they would dress the chapel. So she donates those items to the Lady of the Council of And again, back to the family portraits and how they documented this time period of great transition, right? Um, I think the family was keen to understand that um, a written record is important. In fact, in the 1860s um, and 70s, when Hubert Bancroft is going around California collecting stories to document a major history of California, he was a professor at UC Berkeley. Um, he visits the Del Valle family, or they receive a letter uh, from a neighbor, from another friend. Um, I think it's the Bolviva was a judge during that time period. And he says, this man, this historian, is documenting um, different histories of Los Angeles, of the old families, the old time. You should give him some items. Uh, she doesn't. And I think she doesn't because she wants to maintain it. Right? She keeps it in the family's possession. Um, but those, a lot of those collections are up at the Bancroft Library in UC Berkeley. Um, but I think the photography, taking advantage of different photographers who are coming through California, documenting change, documenting production, documenting development. For many, they're documenting Ramona, right? So there are photographers who came through and they wanted to um, take pictures of the real home of Ramona. Um, but the family, I think, quite savvily says, no, you're going to take a family picture of us. <laughs> and so you have pictures like this who that come out in pictures about Ramona, but it's really the Del Valle family. And here's another one up close. Uh, so you can see the number of people who gathered, the visitors, workers, um, all part of the Del Valle family, and how they recreated home at Rancho Gomez. Right. 
And finally, just talking about a little bit of legacies and maintaining family authority and importance. This is Lorenita Forrester Weisenberg. She's no longer with us, but she was Josefa's granddaughter. And she remembered visiting her grandmother in Los Angeles. Um, and behind her is a portrait that was painted for Josefa's wedding. Um, and yeah, so she kind of carried on the tradition of maintaining family documents and family archives. And she donated um, back in early 2002 um, Josefa's letters, which is how my research began, to the special collections of UC Irvine. So I'm always indebted to her <laughs> to mention. Um, so yeah, I hope that gives you a little sharper picture of what 19th century California might have looked like for some of these families in a moment of great change. And thank you very much. So, so one of the things that, I mean, in, in theory, ideally, right, whether it's other circumstances that lead people and women to lose their land or like a bunch of different dynamics, but because the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo's, you know, articulates two, two big rights. One is um, citizenship, right, to folks who are living here, and land, their land. Um, so if you had title to land, even as a woman, that was not in question. In fact, um, it is notable that this, the neighboring rancho, Rancho Dominguez, right, had four daughters. Um, I think three of them marry American men who then get access to their land. So Carson, Watts, Watson, right? So City of Watts, City of Carson. So those men kind of, so it becomes, I don't think it's a, I mean, you can debate whether there was, you know, they were only marrying them for their land, but this is something that's understood. Oh, these these families have land, these women have land, we're all mixing together, and so it's no surprise that American men marry uh, California, Californianas. Well, it's not too different than our story. <laughs> John Temple. Yeah, right, right. Is, is, and is that how it's, because um, Nieto, it's her father, right? No. No, but they, they are related. But they are related. Yeah, it's a, it's a second so, cousin. Yeah. yeah. But he, he still paid for the land. Right, wasn't right. So given. Can, and there are, there are Americans who do kind of petition under it, who come before the United States, right, before 1848, and also petition for land grants and do get them, or they purchase them. Um, so, yeah, no, it's, it's true. So it does that get, didn't cost them. Of course, there was always a man in the picture anyway. Kind of, yeah. I mean, to say there were like, that I can't remember off the top of my head the particular names, but there are some select studies where women do get a land grant, they do maintain their land, and they keep it. I want to say one is down in San Diego area. Um, I'm having issues, I can't think of it right now. I, I don't want to cross because I'm thinking of two two women. Their names are very similar, and one of them <laughs> one of them was had a mansion, and one of them had land, and she keeps it. Um, so yeah, but it's an interesting. Thing. So all her letters were in Spanish, and later on, even after the war, in the 1800s. Yeah, she, she doesn't pass. Josefa doesn't pass till 1900. Yeah, and it's always in Spanish. She'll get a letter, and it's hard because. Um, What's interesting is that it's letters that she wrote, but there's a few records of what the ones she received. So I don't know what happens. But even when she got stuff in English, she would write in Spanish. Um, but yeah, yeah, all in Spanish. And then what's interesting, Josefa, 
just to kind of continue, when she moves back to Los Angeles, she has evening services at her home. She has this little kind of altar chapel type thing. And she always has a lot of people at her home. Um, like what Lorenita would say, that dining table was 20, let's say 20, and there were always 20 people at this home. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting. Um, when her when her parents get married, there's a picture of them all seated at this table in Los Angeles. You kind of think, oh, she brought these practices from Rancho Cabulos uh, and then took them back to Los Angeles. I think they lived on Grand Avenue. Did you think you mentioned the, the letters to the, 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 the World Expo in uh -huh. Chicago and then who who wrote who? <laughs> so the, the what's interesting is there's a collection of letters that Josefa writes. Um, they go to Niagara Falls for their honeymoon, so she and they do this cross country tour. So they take the train out to New York. There, Niagara Falls, with the you know in the background they have pictures of that. They stop in Baltimore, Washington D.C., and then um, on a separate trip they go to Chicago. And this is something I'm so curious to learn more about is that it looks like there's a contingent of California families that go out to the World Expo in 1893. And, um, and there's several um, documents because she writes home to her mother in that letter. I don't know if it's that specific letter or the next one. And she's like, oh, we ran into these people on the street. Oh, we ran into like the coronel. We saw him over there. And they were mentioning people from back home. Who were also there with that um, That was a fair that was featuring a lot of California. It's kind of like crazy for anything that people want to support. Like from other parts of the world, putting indigenous people on display. It's like it's a it's where the world kind of is on display. Um, she she also writes about how the different items they're producing. Display like all the agricultural products that are coming out of California. Um, what also draws them out to Chicago is that there's a Catholic convention taking place at the same time. So, in one of her letters, she said, Oh, yeah, the fair was really great, but I really like the Catholic convention and listening to the priest from Italy, you know. <laughs> um, so, I think there are two events that take them out there, but it's really interesting to see who's there. And I write about this in an article that I've that um, she gets a little um, disappointed about the skewed view of California because it seems from her letter that what's on display is a focus on Native people, not Native Americans, like Indian tribes in California. And she says that's they should know that's not the only thing that's out there in California. And you you get this sense from from the letters, from pictures, from other things that folks are worried about losing relevance. They're worried about, you know, this one world that they dominated is now one being replaced through land, through culture, through popular, you know, tourism, all kinds of things, right? Um, and then if there is something, it's not that, right? It's native people. It's, it's, it's something that kind of she, she mentions in passing, but you can't help but put it in the context of all these changes. Like, how do we kind of keep our, our foot in this game you know, and be relevant? So that's something that I, I kind of think is happening within that way. Especially when a lot of um, boosterism is talking about the Spanish past, right? It's always kind of, these are people from the past and not necessarily They're remnants of the past, right? And so that's why I spend a little time talking about Ramona because um, one of the things that is ironic about that is that Helen Hunt Jackson goes there to get inspiration of an old California. But if she were to go to what looked like an old California before Americans came, it would be 
nothing, right? It would be that one single adobe structure. She wouldn't go to the rancho. She would go to the plaza because that's where everybody was. Right? Like, nobody lived in the rancho. They lived somewhere else. So it's kind of like a skewed, like the, what she saw, that dynamic world was a modern world. Right? It was a contemporary world of the little riders. It wasn't how they had been living for decades or since they had arrived in California. It was something that had produced in that moment in response to those contemporary changes. So it's new. It's modern. It's great. It was an entity that not the way it was. So I think that's an interesting thing. In fact, uh, Natural Mobile was up for the plan. Yes, yes, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> is, is the structure still there? Yes, it is. Um, they, uh, Natural Mobile is a, a historic site. It's on the National Registrar. It's on the National Registrar. Um, and so with that, they were able to get funding after the Northridge earthquake to rehab some of their spaces. So, but yeah, they're there. They have programming. They just built a new visitor center and, and you can see the landscape they have. I think it's called Last Sundays. They have events out there. Um, yeah, it's nice. So when the family moved to the ranch, what year was that? 1861. And, uh, do you happen to know when did they upgrade <coughs> amenities to electricity, um, uh, you know, uh, plumbing? Yeah, good question. So, I, I don't, I don't know, I don't know, but I'm thinking, so the family, the family lives there, and like the peak I would say is the 80s and 90s, and then, um, Isabel gets older and frail, and she moves back to Los Angeles. And then Josefa gets, she gets married in 1886. And um, she doesn't, she has a child in 18, late 1890s. And then her husband gets really sick when she's expecting her second child. And he passes before the child. And so she now has two children to raise, and so she moves. That's when she permanently moves. And after that point, it's not quite clear who lives. I think well, a brother lives there temporarily, so I don't know if it's wired at that, you know, in the early 1900s. And then by the 1920s, they sell to the Rubel family, which is a family from Sweden. They pick up the farm, but the land has only been in those two families, and and now it's still under, like part of a co-op. The Rubel families they kind of run it as a farming co-op with some other landowners out there. And who owns the the ranch, the, the building? The actual building, I think the Rubel family is still owns, oh, and then so the foundation not... runs it. Mm -hmm. There's a programming. Yeah, I want to say it's still under private ownership. Oh. Yeah, it's not operated by a county or uh, city agency. Um, so yeah, it's just really interesting. <laughs> Thank you so much for your question. Yeah. I'm sorry, there's so few people here. This is yeah. wonderful. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate it. We have it all recorded. <laughs> 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 I hope the mic doesn't throw it no. off too much. <laughs> well, thank you so much for... Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you so much for this thank is wonderful. You. Thank you for being here. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I enjoy sharing stories.